Now, days after our winter storm and another historic round of snow and ice rolled through Texas and knocked out power to millions of people there. A week later, many of them are still going without power right now. Now, to boil it down, two storms caused the same kind of disaster in two states. But what a lot of people might not know is just how different the systems that power those states are. And that's important when we're talking about this, having this conversation. When it comes to preparing for more of these disasters down the road, we need to know the facts. Here's Maggie Vespa. I got four kids at home and I'm, we're all freezing. Hundreds of thousands of Oregonians and millions of Texans were left powerless last week. Many still are. I don't know how we could get to this point. Historic snow and ice storms exposed vulnerabilities in each state's power grid. My goodness, this last week has just been insane to watch from our perspective. It's been insane to live, Maggie. Uh, to get a better idea of how Texas's grid works, I spoke with Jason Whiteley, a reporter with WFAA, KGW's sister station in Dallas. When it comes to power, the state is an island. Here's the short version of it. In the United States, there are three major power grids, one on the East Coast, one on the West Coast, and right in the middle is a little tiny power grid, the state of Texas. Not all of Texas, not Amarillo, not out in El Paso either, but most of Texas, 90% of Texas, is on its own power grid. One big question, why would Texas want to be its own power island? What are the benefits of that? I mean, it boils down to pricing for consumers, does it not? It all boils down to pricing. When, when the state legislature here in 1999 decided to deregulate Texas and break up the, the public utilities, they thought that the prices would come down for consumers. And in fact, you know, Texas consumers can shop for electricity all the way down to the, you know, the kilowatt hour. Now let's compare that to Oregon system, which is highly regulated and yes, shares power with much of that West Coast grid. It's called the Western Interconnection. All the states who share power on it are shaded in orange on this map. All right, so Ben joining us now. For ben, more, we again, turned really to Ben Quila, the director of power planning for the Northwest Power and Conservation Council. How would you describe that to someone who hasn't isn't familiar with this um, subject? So the Western Interconnection is a really big machine. It goes all the way across the international borders from Canada down to Mexico and across all of the Western states. It's something that helps us because it diversifies any risk. It also, at times, creates risk. But if there's problems elsewhere in the West, that that can be something that causes challenges in, in the state of Oregon or in the region. When we saw problems in the summer in California, which is something that happened very recently, um, it caused very high prices for power. So if a utility that serves somebody in Oregon was out buying power at the same time that California was was looking for power, they had to pay a, a very high premium for it. And, and that has an impact on, on their cost, which ultimately gets passed on to the people who pay bills. That said, when it comes to pricing, Oregonians have far more protections than Texans. To put it bluntly, Oregon's system is highly regulated. The system in Texas is not regulated at all. Here in Oregon, for example, the state's Public Utility Commission requires companies submit integrated resource plans. That's basically a data-supported forecast of how much energy a company expects to purchase versus how much their customers will likely need. It's a balance known as least cost, least risk, and most of the time it helps keep prices low. Another regulation, Oregon requires companies weatherize their power plants and equipment. Texas does not. There's just so, so much uncertainty with the yeah, pipes at this time. And that, widely noted, is cited as a key cause of the state's outages. The power plants were not ready. 60% of them were ready. They had all their coats on their power plants and everything like that. They were ready to go. 40% were wearing lightweight jackets, and that just did not hold up. Same thing for the wind turbines, the nuclear powered power plants, coal powered and natural gas powered. Blame can be spread across the board. In Oregon, officials blame our outages largely on downed trees that time after time damaged lines and equipment. Look at those power lines. The two states do have one thing in common. Officials in Oregon and Texas will be combing through what happened and how in the future to prevent it. This as climate change promises to produce more severe weather events. And that's a, a new paradigm for how we plan the system. You need to be prepared for something that goes beyond that historic experience. Maggie Vespa, KGW News.